This podcast is made possible by VersaPay. Hi, this is Jeff Shepard, CFO at Advanced Auto Parts, and you're listening to CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 879. Uh, the key is, you know, what is my sales capacity? You know, what kind of pipeline am I generating? How am I developing my, my sales capacity? And then just as important and what a lot of people forget is like, are the efficiency metrics changing? Because it's one thing to add capacity, both from a pipeline or from a feed on the street sales rep capacity. But if you do it in an inefficient or, or unsustainable way, you're going to fail as a business. So it's really important to make sure that from a cohort perspective, from an individual perspective, from a campaign perspective, you keep measuring like how efficient is this. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Boz Brooks, CFO of a Lego. When it comes to finance leaders who are counted among the ranks of today's SaaS CFOs, it goes without saying that 20 years ago, most were somewhere other than at SaaS companies. In fact, many of them have no doubt arrived inside the SaaS realm only within the past 10 years or so as part of the software industry's great migration from the model of perpetually selling software to the SaaS subscription model. However, for CFO Boz Brooks, the SaaS world has been home for more than 20 years, a fact that allows him to take a seat alongside other CFOs who can boast of having pioneer roots inside the SaaS realm. Oz Brooks joins us after this. When your accounts receivable automation focuses only on back office tasks, you forget the most important stakeholder your customers. VersaPay gives you all the tools you need to automate those tasks, plus the collaboration tools to take on everything that automation alone simply can't. This doesn't just increase efficiencies and accelerate cash flow, but also creates a dramatically improved experience for your customers. And as the economy tightens, can you really afford to risk losing customers over an invoice to cash process they find frustrating. With VersaPay, clients typically achieve 50% less time managing receivables, 25% faster payments, 30% fewer past due invoices, and 81% customer portal adoption. Learn more about VersaPay's collaborative AR ERP payments and cash application solutions at versapay.com slash CFO. And hello, we're speaking with Boz Brooks, CFO of Alego. Boz, welcome. Thank you, Jack. I'm excited to be on this podcast. So, Boz, as we do with all our guests, we begin by asking them to look back for us. And we, what we want is some of those experiences that you feel prepared you for this role, made a difference uh, on the path to becoming a leader. Anything come to mind for you? Uh, yeah, so, so my, my fir very first job out of, out of school was working for um, MCI down in Atlanta. And what was really excited about that opportunity is that I got right into the point where they were launching the internet products for mainly for businesses. So worked with big companies like uh, Microsoft and, and others to get started on the internet in a big scale and help MCI sell those products, working with the sales force in terms of how, how they would price it. Um, and it really made a difference. And we were one of the leaders in the, uh, in the internet. Um, so it was pretty much uncharted territory. So there's a lot of collaboration with product managers, with um, provisioning, with the technology uh, folks. 
And it really um, allowed me to to work with all the different stakeholders. And I think that was a good good start and a good basis for the rest of my career to really you know understand other functions in a business and help them be successful while also making sure that at the end of the day, you know, we had a profitable, long-term, sustainable product. And were you embedded with different teams, helping them price and, and debating uh, what was the correct cost structure, what have you? Or Yeah, exactly. I, I was part of the, the finance team of the business market division. So I worked, um, again, down in, in Atlanta, Georgia, where the business markets were for MCI at the time. Really, I mean, my, my personal curiosity allowed me to learn a lot about the product and pretty much propelled me to one of the specialists in terms of how to uh, position, price these products, uh, keeping everything, you know, all the different aspects I just mentioned, uh, the cost, the provisioning, how it would take, the, com- the competitive environment. So after that, I, you know, as much as I liked that opportunity and really um, was really grateful for all the different learning experience in that career, I decided I wanted to be in a, um, a smaller company environment. So I went to some smaller companies that were um, code capital backed, which is a whole different learning experience. Now you're constrained from a cost perspective, from a cash resource and um, it really propelled my role more into thinking about long-term planning from a whole business perspective. So what, what does a company want to achieve? How, how do they want to get there? And what kind of resources and what kind of metrics and what kind of milestones do we need to achieve as a business to get to that long-term growth? And again, that allowed me to work with all the different stakeholders, uh, both internally but now also externally, because now you have investors, you have board of directors, and you have to work with their expectations and their their goals and their constraints and, and their understandings of the business and kind of be that middle point between all those stakeholders and create a, um, a vision and a path towards that vision for the company. I want to point out to uh, the listeners that uh, – you were at a number of different companies early in your career, but then you really do make an investment. And uh, one is at Vocus, where you were there 12 years. And then uh, you step into a CFO role, I believe, at Clara Bridge, where you spent nine years, nearly 10 years. Yeah, that's right. So after I left MCI, I was with two companies that were smaller. First, a, a, a telecom uh, infrastructure provider that... Um, I was with about a year. Again, a great experience to get started having a broader financial role after being with a bit of bigger company and learning that. But that company actually ended up getting sold. And then I was with a technology company. I really have an affiliation with um, uh, technology. So started with a small software company that was a really interesting uh, experience as well, about 100 employees, fast growing. Um but also that, that ended up getting sold after the, the, the dot-com bust. And then, as you said, Jack, I, I ended up at Focus and ended up being there for 12 years, which was a great experience. We started, it, when I joined, they were fairly small, uh, maybe in the 5 to $10 million in revenue. They were one of the pioneers uh, being a, a SaaS company, a software as a subscription. This is back in the early 2000s when the... There was not too many of those companies around, but the uh, founder and CEO of that company really had a vision to um, uh, offer the, the software as a subscription as opposed to an, an installed copy. So that was a really an exciting story. The company grew from you know the five to ten million when I joined to over two hundred million. Uh, we raised capital, we raised debt, we went public halfway through, and that was just really an exciting. Story. I was the VP of financial planning and analysis and worked closely with the CFO, the CEO. Now, I think you're you're talking about Vocus and uh, would be interested to know when, when you first arrived there, was it uh, already a subscription business or were they starting the, the journey? They, they had made the decision when I joined. And so the last, the, the, the first couple of years, maybe two years, we were in the in the process of migrating everybody over. 
uh, but it happened pretty quick. The early days of the SaaS model and you know what the priorities were then versus now, that is something that a lot of SaaS finance leaders, a lot of SaaS executives today would probably find really interesting. And, and I don't know if I'm anything's coming to mind. Maybe not. Maybe you'd say, Jack, well, it's not all that dissimilar. Um, but if you think about it, some of the debates you were having at the time in the past, some of that discussion back then, and anything come to mind or yeah i mean sure i mean it's 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 a long time ago right so and um you know we had the benefit of not knowing what we we didn't know back then right so um we would have a lot of internal discussions about um and more detailed planning that i say we do now because we don't have the the benefit of the, having those shortcuts where you know you look at renewal rates and customer acquisition costs and they're clearly well defined now so we kind of had to had to um, learn that, but I would say I think we spend a lot of time on detailed planning and detailed analysis um, that really allowed us to be um, successful. But again, it was it was harder back then because you, you you didn't have that framework or that guidance and is metrics that are available now. So any any disconnect with the analyst community as you were trying to reveal to them and educate them about the model. Yeah, so we were one of the earlier, uh, not only the, one of the earlier SaaS companies, but one of the earlier ones that went public. We went public in um, late 2005, and we did a lot of education with analysts and investors that were new to the SaaS model, right? They, they didn't understand um, the impact, deferred revenue, the, the importance of deferred revenue or, or backlog, as we call it now. Um, you know, the, the revenue, right? The revenue lags. So it's not, you know, you don't have as much variability on the revenue, which was a benefit for us. It made our job easier because <laughs> our revenue was much more predictable than a lot of people uh, thought it was. So we were able to manage expectations pretty closely and, and, and of course, beat them. Um, but yeah, so a lot of, a lot of, we did a lot of educa- education with, um, analysts and investors in terms of the SaaS model. And by that time, you know, we had been running a SaaS model for four or five years. So we understood it. You know, we kind of had lived all the surprises and, and all the benefits and, you know, what what's important, what are the drivers for a SaaS model. Um, and so we could use that knowledge to really create a compelling story about our business, but also educate uh, people on, um, on what it, what it, what a SaaS model looks, right? And what, what are the important metrics? What are the important drivers? What should you be looking at? What are the indicators of, of where we go from here uh, successfully? So it was an exciting time. It was really, uh, and I, you know, I, I'd enjoyed working with a lot of the analysts. I'm still close friends with some of them uh, from back in the early days of SaaS, yeah. You mentioned Salesforce, of course, and uh, some of the earlier, the pioneering SaaS companies. What was benchmarking like? Yeah, so there was it was. I don't think we disclosed as much as as people do now. Um, you know, I think like, I think early on we didn't even even disclose a, a revenue uh, renewal rate or you know sales renewal rate, which kind of now is table stakes for a SaaS company. I think back then it was more. Um, P and L benchmarks, right? Cost of revenue is really important uh, for SaaS companies. It's a pretty, uh, pretty high gross margin business typically. Uh, sales and marketing spend, you know, those type of things were the classical. Um, kind of. So we're in a transition period from you know traditional quote unquote financial reporting to really, you know, what are the true um, important disclosures and, and metrics for SaaS and. And again, we, I don't think we disclosed as much as companies do now, so we had it easier. But then, you know, as we, um, as we grew toward, because I was there for about seven years as a public company, and towards the end, you know, we really had to go uh, disclose more renewal, um, renewal rate information, um, you know, deferred revenue, backlog, uh, you know, unbuilt backlog, those typical the metrics that are very common now, but they weren't in the beginning. So your, your career really did parallel the rise of the cloud. 
uh, phenomenon. I mean, you arrive in 2001 at Vocus and you leave 12 years later. It's a whole different realm, established benchmarks, as you were just explaining, established uh, unit economics. Uh, as for you, you uh, are vice president of financial planning and analysis. And you do step into a CFO role shortly after your leave focus or directly from uh, your departure there. Um, but give us a sense of how you, when you arrived there back in 2001, are you just a um, financial analyst or, or how did you climb the ladder there? Yeah, no, so I was hired. Um, and, and again, when I, um, when I joined, they were a fairly small organization. They might have gotten 100 employees or so. So... Uh, they had hired a CFO, first-time CFO, a couple of months before I joined, and he hired a, both a um, financial planning and analysis guy, which was me. So I worked directly for the CFO and a controller for the, um, you know, for the accounting side of the business. And you know, that was the core financial team, and we grew with the company over the twelve years. And so I, I remained the leader of. Uh, financial planning and analysis and uh, became involved in investor relations and all that fun stuff as we went public. Yeah. And when, when, I'm sorry, when was the IPO again? Uh, uh, 2005. Great time at Focus, really growing the business, going public, getting that experience, doing a lot of acquisitions. I think we did like 10 or 12 acquisitions along the time, raised money. So I learned a lot. Um, so after 12 years, this opportunity at Clarabitch uh, presents itself, which at the time was maybe 20 million in revenue. Really exciting technology. They um, had built an, a, a text analytics platform for customer experience um, data and particularly analyzing unstructured feedback uh, from conversations, from social media, from emails. Uh, working with big customers like United, Walmart, um, Best Buy, among among a lot of others, selling big, big solutions, helping those companies improve their customer experience. So really attracted to the opportunity um, and, and to be a first time CFO, of course. So, um, so yeah, that, 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 um, that propelled my, or that motivated me to, to move to, um, to Clarabridge. Now, one of the interesting um, uh, aspects was, and I'm, I'm going to, I think, uh, talk more about that later, but there was a pivotal moment there when I joined. Uh, they were still pretty much a perpetual software company where they would sell a license as opposed to SaaS. And, you know, one of the things that, um, I, a, I was attracted for them to hire me as a CFO was my experience, right? Was, I had 12 or 10 years, 12 years of um, SaaS ex finance experience uh, at that time, which, you know, was still, still a lot. Um, and so, so there was a great opportunity with that company from a uh, market opportunity, from a, what we could do transitional. I could kind of see what, what, what we could help, what I could do to help the, the company uh, grow and really be a, a, a marquee company in that space uh, with great financial results. So, um, and it was an exciting, it's been an exciting story. There have been a, a, a few milestones. Uh, first, when I joined, we started a fundraising process right away, um, which resulted in a specific, uh, a fairly sizable investment of about 80 million, uh, about nine months later brought in world-class investors, um, Summit Partners and General Catalyst out of Boston, and actually uh, got us a, a new executive chairman, Yu Chun Li, who is uh, by coincidence also the uh, CEO of Allego. And it really uh, pro provided us with the financial backing as well as the, uh, the expertise to, to, you know, to make that journey from, from a, $20 million company to ultimately uh, being well, well over a hundred million by the time we got sold uh, about uh, last year. So it had been an exciting, and we did some acquisitions along the way. We, we raised uh, a little bit more money and it, it really turned out to be a, a great journey. Nice. Thank you for taking a look back for us, boss. So 
we'd like to find out about Allego. Tell us something about this company. What does it do and what are its offerings today? Yeah, so so Allego helps um, companies make help make their sales force, the sales reps more, more effective, more efficient. And we do that by offering an AI-based platform that helps train, mentor, coach sales reps, but also helps them engage with their customers by finding the right content at the right time and distribute it to their prospects and their their current customers at the right time in the right medium. And so we really automate that process, um, help, uh, help with recommendations of content, help with recommendations on coaching, and we do that for about 750,000 daily users in 65 countries. And our, our customer base runs from uh, runs across many different industry verticals. Uh, for example, we have five of the 10 largest banks as customers, three of the top five pharmaceutical companies, and many small to large tech companies. It's a really exciting space to be in um, to help, help, help our customers uh, really leverage and and optimize their sales reps and provide the platform to do it all. One platform to. Uh, can I ask, is it a distinguish what sets it apart is sort of the training and the uh, assistance it gives to the sales rep as they, you know, seek to build relationships with clients. So if sales enablement leader can use our platform to, to train and mentor the sales force, uh, train on new product fe- features, um, help on um, you know regulation. Like if there's you know a lot of our companies uh, have specific regulations on what sales reps need to be trained on. Think medical devices, think uh, financial sales. So we help um, train the sales reps there, but then we also help um, distribute content whether to, to customers. So if you're a sales rep, our platform will help you find the right content, whether it be a video, a, a PowerPoint, a Word document, a use case, find the right uh, content to distribute to your prospect. And it will, it will recommend um, what content to distribute at what point in the sales cycle. And it will measure how effective was this piece of content in terms of closing, closing this sale, moving it along the, uh, the, the pipeline, et cetera. So as a finance leader, this is a great insight in terms of am I generating the, great, the right content? But it also allows you to create um, intelligence based on how that content is consumed in terms of how, how far is this deal in the sales cycle and is this likely to close? So it's it's cutting edge technology, and uh, we, start, we lev- of course we're leveraging it internally, and it, it it allows me just one more data point in terms of what is the health of my uh, pipeline and what can we expect in sales and over what time. Well, I I think uh, I often like to ask about capital structure. I believe this is a private equity owned company today, and I'm just curious: did the private equity firm buy a Lego in the last? Three or five years? No, so this is this is mainly um, founder and employee owned with a minority ownership of um, some uh, growth capital providers. And I, I joined the company about three, four months ago. I think I think that money was raised um, at the end of twenty twenty, so about two years ago. So, but it's majority uh, employee owned, founder and and employees. With a small, small growth capital component, yeah. So when we always like to ask about your lines of sight, and again, you only arrived in the last four uh, months, uh, but we're wondering, as you look into the business, um, is there anything you may have done already to, uh, and maybe reorganize is too strong a word, but you, you've changed things. You've added some talent. You've introduced a, a new approach don't know but tell us about whether your information needs are satisfied and if you're looking to extend your lines of sight deeper 
Yeah, so um, so I had the benefit throughout my career, uh, work for a variety of companies, but also, you know, as I mentioned, we did a lot of acquisitions along the way. I did probably 10 or 12 at, at uh, various sizes at Focus, and then we did a few at Clarabridge. But of course, we looked at many more companies. So, so one of the benefits I've had from my career is that I've looked at a lot of different businesses, right, and really tried to uh, analyze it quickly, like what are the drivers, what are the critical success factors, what are they doing right, you know, what can be improved. So I have the benefit that I can use that in a new opportunity for myself as a Lego. So, um, you know, it's a great company, you know, very excited to be part of it. Um, but, you know, as, as I started, I've started to analyze, hey, what 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 can be optimized and really create a framework for growth, right? So what are the key top drivers? What are the key things that the company does well? And how do they need to develop um, over the next few years to ultimately have a successful exit? Um, so, so as I, you know, learn and talk to, my, you know, the fellow executive team members, the stakeholders, uh, the senior leadership, and start to identify the drivers, the success factors, I start to build the financial model in terms of like, hey, how is this going to, uh, how is this going to allow Allego to grow uh, with the constraints, right? You know, as, as a high growth tech company, there's always constraints, particularly capital, but also, uh, you know, how can you efficiently scale and grow? And, you know, there's many different metrics that, that allow you to measure that. And, um, and they're a little bit different for each business. So, you know, as I learn the business and I start developing the models and put that in place, um, you know, the, 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 the path is becoming clearer and clearer in terms of where we, where we want to go and how we're going to get there. We always like to ask for your top of mind metrics. We're curious, uh, and I suspect it's uh, the SaaS metrics that we were talking about earlier, but um, at the same time, can you tell us what you're looking at on a regular basis? What is it that you're looking at before your first cup of coffee in the morning? What numbers, what metrics? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, as, as a, it's, it's really sales growth, right? So uh, the key is, you know, what is my sales capacity? You know, what kind of pipeline am I generating? Uh, how am I developing my, my sales capacity? And then just as important and what a lot of people forget is like, are the efficiency metrics changing, right? Because it's one thing to add capacity, both from a pipeline or, 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 or from a feed on the street sales rep capacity. But if you do it in an inefficient or, or unsustainable way, you're going to fail as a business. So it's really important to make sure that from a cohort perspective, from an individual perspective, from a campaign perspective, you keep measuring like how efficient is this? Is this, are we not taking a step backwards in terms of um, growing the business? Because it's all about scalability over time. And, um, you know, it's, you can't indefinitely throw more money at a problem, right? It's got to be more efficient. It's got to be more scalable. So, so really taking that, um, the deeper look and say like, are these new initiatives as part of our growth strategy performing uh, like we expected and like we need to? So, so that's really you know one of the key things I'm, I'm focusing on, and um, and then it's just about maximizing that, right? So you, again, you want to grow as fast as possible. So if you feel like you're on the right stride, there's no no inefficiencies or no unexpected inefficiencies, then you can start adding more to it all within the, uh, the bigger constraint of, of capital, uh, which, you know, it's important to have a really predictable corporate financial model. So you really know exactly, um, you know, what your position is going to be cash position over time, and then utilize that to the, 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 the maximum amount available. When we talk to finance leaders, we're always looking for where the data and finance meet, non-financial metrics, perhaps. Maybe I should ask you that. Is there a non-financial metric that has become more top of mind within the organization now that you have all this data uh, that you can correlate and, and study? 
um, you know, as you say, Jack, usage data is very important, right? We look at specific, like how many active daily users do we have? And, you know, one of the things at Allego, what we try to correlate is, you know, looking at the daily average user, users and how they interact with our software and look at that growth and see if that also matches the revenue growth. Because if not, you know, we're missing out on opportunities, right? We, we either, you know, not, don't charge enough, we don't charge enough for our action. So that's one of the things that actually at Allego where I do think we have a big opportunity. We see a big increase in the amount of users and the, uh, the way they interact with our software. And, you know, there's probably opportunities there for additional revenue growth if, you, if, it's, if it's somewhat um, uncorrelated. And then, you know, I work with, I've worked with the, uh, the different other leaders in the company to see, okay, what, what is it? Where, where are we missing this connection? And how can we really uh, close the gap and create, create additional revenue for the company? So it's a great opportunity. And uh, one of the things that was pretty evident early on by kind of matching that kind of non-financial um, information data to financial data and, and, and try to, to optimize the business by, by just looking at those, leveraging those two different data points. You mentioned, uh, again, that from what I understand, part of the value that you deliver to your uh, users is uh, content. And uh, there might be videos, as you described, and what have you. Um, that capability, is that something that you can see the impact of when certain content is made available to your users, that they're engaging more with the platform because of that access to content? I mean, how does it, can you, am I describing that in a way you would think is accurate? Yeah, so we enable our customers to leverage their internal content, right? So we don't provide content to our customers as part of our, our offering, as part of a sales process. You know, we, we share uh, product videos and, and, and product use cases with our customers, just the same as we um, want our customers to do, u- utilizing our platform. So if you're a sales rep for one of our customers, what a Lego will uh, help you do is find the right piece of content for your prospect at your point in your sales cycle. It will say, hey, Jack, you know, your customer is pretty close to buying. They really need this great reference video we have from this customer. So why don't you share this with them? And our tool, our platform allows you to email that and, and of course, track whether it's worth watched. But also one of the newer offerings is a digital sales room where you can create a private room on the on the on the uh, on the internet on on the website for your customer where they can interact with you and you can interact with the, with them and you can share this this great reference video. It really helps might help close the deal. And then from uh, what we help our customers with is aggregate that data and fine-tune the recommendations, right? Say, hey, Jack closed this deal because he, in large part, because he shared this great video at the at the end of the sales cycle. So and the other 100 <laughs> reps okay, that are at the same point with their customers, you can say, like, hey, have you tried sharing this video? Because it might it might help close this video. So, uh, so that's one of the great uh, functionalities of our platform. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Always interesting to discover how content uh, contributes uh, to the to the sales process or approach. So we're up to where we'd like to ask our finance strategic moment question. And this could have happened anytime during the course of your career where you had a moment of insight or experience that led you uh, to look at the world a little differently, led you to pursue a risk, excuse me, avoid a risk, pursue an opportunity. Anything come to mind? when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Yeah, so I think that, that oppor- one of the big revelations and, and opportunity for me was when, you know, I had joined Clarevich as my first CFO job. And, you know, I'd spent uh, a little bit of time learning the business. And what at the time, the company was really a, an old school perpetual seller of software. And, you know, after learning it, I could feel having the experience in, in SaaS prior to that, I could feel that, you know, the customers, the company, everything was right to 
to make that conversions in a in a pretty drastic way. Um, and it, you know, I felt comfortable really betting a lot, including my own my own reputation in in making that change. And we and and so we basically discontinued our uh, or my recommend largely my recommendation recommended um, uh, stopping the perpetual uh, sale going forward, uh, revamping the sales comp structure and putting in a strategy for converting any remaining customers that's still on a perpetual maintenance platform. Um, and that really changed the trajectory of the company. And, um, but also as a consequence, you know, really got myself to credibility as a, as a strategic finance leader and help, you know, really be, um, be a successful part of the company and, and create a lot of, um, a lot of credibility and, 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 and confidence to, to help the company further grow to, uh, to one of the leader leading companies in its space at the time. So, so that was a really pivotal moment early on in my CFO career. Hello and welcome to 60 Second Stories from CFO Thought Leader. It was only last year that AT&T decided to leave the entertainment business and announced plans to relinquish its ownership of Warner Media. Not unlike many of his finance leader peers, the business headlines of the past have everything and nothing to do with the ups and downs of CFO Michael Kopelman's finance career. Turn back the clock seven years and Michael Kopelman was residing at the top of Warner's investor relations function. Collaborating daily with Warner's senior leaders, Kopelman tells us he took charge of the company's earnings communications process. According to Kopelman, it was pretty much business as usual until there was a knock on the door from an interested buyer. You'll hear that story and more on episode number 873 of CFO Thought Leader featuring CFO Michael Kopelman of Meow Wolf. Remember, the future of finance is listening. We're going to jump to what we refer to as our mentoring round, where I'll ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. We'd like you to look back and think back to uh, your Clara Bridge days, but just the first 30 to 60 days, you had stepped into the CFO role, the very early days of your CFO career. Uh, what piece of advice, if you could go back in time and tell that person who was 30 days, 60 days into a CFO job yourself, what is the piece of advice you'd give yourself? Yeah, so, so, so my recommendation would be, um, you know, really take your time understanding the business. Talk to, um, as I did, talk to a lot of different leaders, talk to a lot of different uh, customers, uh, talk to as many uh, of the employees as you can. Um, you know, CFO, including myself, tend to be pretty type A personalities and want to make impact and change early on. And, and there's a lot of pressure, especially in your first CFO job, you know, Looking back, you know, I would give myself the um, um, the advice of you know take your time, understand the business, um, you know, talk to again, talk to as many um, different people, and and then you know it will become clear. But you know, I would give give you give yourself time to to really get your feet wet and um, don't feel the pressure of making immediate changes uh, just because you're new to the role. Uh, that would be um, that would be my, my, my one thing that uh, that somebody would should have told me and that I would like to instill in anybody that's uh, that's starting their CFO journey. Plus, we always like to ask our guests to look a little bit uh, uh, on the personal side with us, reflect on the personal side with us. Uh, we're wondering if you are you have a personal habit, or maybe there's part of a daily routine that you have that you're known for, something that sets you apart from other finance executives. So uh, it might be something a family member. This is something maybe a family member would point out to us. That's just Boz. That's the way he does it. Um, any, anything come to mind? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I have a, a pretty dark, dry sense of humor, so I like to, um, you know, I like to, first of all, I think it's important to have fun in your job, right? So I always tell my team members, you know, we should have fun. We, we're a team. We're doing this together. Um, we should have fun. But I think people are always surprised by um, my relative dry sense of uh, humor and, um, you know, don't necessarily expect that in a CFO. We just had our kickoff uh, with a Lego. And of course I had to do an introduction, share the plan and, um, you know, got, 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 got everybody to have some fun, some unexpected fun from the CFO. And, um, so that's a little bit of a trademark, um, a trademark, a personal trait, if you like it. Um, we wonder if you have a book selection for us. Doesn't have to be a business book. Maybe it's uh, something you read to escape with. Don't know. Yeah. So one of my favorite books. It's a good question, Jack. So what um, you know, I like. It's it's kind of like a hybrid between a business book and and, and not. You know, I, I of course I like business. I'm a CFO. I have a career in business, so I like to read about businesses. But um, I like to read real life stories and learn from those. So one of the most intriguing books that I've, that I've read is uh, it's called Disney Wars by James Stewart. It tells the uh, transformation uh, of Disney under Michael Eisner, I think late nineties, early two thousands. And it just, you know, taught me a lot about how business in general works, how, you know, how personal biases, uh, person, personalities get, uh, influence certain deals and outcomes and both in a good and a bad way. So I thought that was a real, and the, the book almost reads like a, uh, you know, like a suspension novel, right? It's, it's very, uh, very well written, but a lot of insight in terms of um, how businesses are successful and the mistakes they make and, and why. So that has been a really great uh, book that I would recommend for anyone. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, we're now up to our final question where we're going to ask you to look forward finally. And we want to know what your priorities are for the next 12 months as CFO. Yeah, so really, the, um, you know, and, and there's a little bit of uncertainty in the market, right, um, as we all know. Uh, so we really have still have to define that and see what the impact will be on, on, on business and our business in general. But the key will be uh, scalability. You know, uh, Allegro is a great company, great platform. It has great customers. So we've kind of have the basis for, for a building a very successful company. But the key is going to be uh, scalability to so make things, um, simplify things, um, organize um, the company in a certain way, and create that predictability and repeatability uh, to really um, to be to remain one of the leaders and and grow this company to um, over 100 million in revenue over the next few years. So that is the initiative, um, really, really simplifying and, and and create that scalability, repeatability. Uh, it's a typical um, transition point for a company our size, and that one that I went through. Uh, with Clarabitch and, and, and Focus as well. Oz Brooks, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you, Jack. It's great to be here. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. As you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as thought leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.